On a cold Sunday in Essex, the fit and healthy run to help the victims of genetic disease. They're raising funds to fight cystic fibrosis, one illness which young people suffer because of genes they inherit from their parents. The money they're raising will help scientists understand more about our genes. But even those fit enough for a five-mile run are starting to realise the latest discoveries affect them too. I had breast cancer about nine months ago, I suppose, and had a mastectomy for that. Um, I was amazed that it's actually meant to be genetic. Terry and Stuart have two children with hearing problems. The reason? Faulty genes in both families. The doctors say that both Stuart and I have got deaf genes. So at the time of conception, the, de you know, the two deaf genes get together and produce a deaf child. The Merrick family have asthma. It's been in their genes for generations. We've been through the uh, doctors and they've uh, diagnosed it. And it's from grandparents and parents and into my children. Mum's got it, Nan's got it, um, and Graham's got it, my great Graham's got it, and my dad has said he had a little bit of it. Many people in this race may ultimately be at risk because of genes they've inherited from their parents, and scientists are now finding ways of telling us which genes those are. But the new knowledge could pose us with tough moral and political choices. Would we want to know if we're at risk from an incurable disease? Who else should know? Should we use the new knowledge to test the genes of unborn children? And how can we be sure that gene revolution doesn't do harm as well as good? You may ask whether, in fact, we should stop the work now, close the Pandora's box, kill the baby before it's born. And I think that that doesn't work. That's not a very useful social answer. I think we should do the science. We should get the knowledge because much good will come out of it. Yeah. But that's got it down to this autumn, Dr. Sidney Brenner and his colleagues in Cambridge begin a project to identify all the genes in the human body. Scientists across the world are racing towards the same goal. It's a task that may take decades but could bring great practical benefit. It's going to lead ultimately to the total understanding of man and to an enormous amount of information that's going to be very important for medicine. Only by learning about our genes can we understand how people can be struck down by genetic disease even in the best years of life. Louise Simon's parents carried one of the most common faulty genes, the one that can cause cystic fibrosis. In the first 16 years of my life, I wasn't too bad. I felt good about life. I felt, I'm not going to let this thing get me, and I'm going to fight it. I want, to, I want to live, I want to be alive, but I want to be well, you know? I want, I want to be normal, not coughing up horrible stuff and feeling lousy all the time. Louise is 22. The average life expectancy for cystic fibrosis sufferers is 25. There's no sign of a cure. <coughs> Louise is kept going by medicine and determination. She also has the prospect of a heart and lung transplant. Scientists hope that by identifying the gene that causes cystic fibrosis, they may find a cure in the distant future. Nobody wants to die. But sometimes it, it gets too much and you can't... You can't cope with it anymore. You know? You're hopeful, though, that you'll have a heart and lung transplant. I know. I know. I'm going <clears> to <throat> have a heart and lung transplant and I'm going to get through it and I'm going to be well. And I know that those are going to be the happiest years of my life. The misery suffered by people like Louise has spurred doctors to try and crack the genetic code that causes it. In some families, they're already close to spotting the faulty gene responsible for cystic fibrosis. And at London's Hammersmith Hospital, they've made a breakthrough which could give parents the chance to avoid passing on faulty genes to their children. Once it's clinically available, couples known to be carriers of genetic disease could be offered the chance of having test tube babies. 
Doctors would be able to check their embryos for defective genes and keep only those that lead to healthy children. It's a technique intended to help those with life-threatening diseases. What kind of defective genes can you spot now? Well, there are about potentially about 3,000 diseases which might be treated in this sort of way in the fairly near future. And at the present time, the only possibility that these people would have would be antenatal detection of genetic disease much later on with termination of pregnancy. And this prevents that need. 3,000 diseases, some of them are very common, like cystic fibrosis, which is a defective gene which is carried by one in 20 of all the population in Britain. Doctors can now spot faulty genes at every stage of human life, from the embryo to the adult. And our definition of genetic disease is still widening. Scientists are now on the track of genes which they believe may predispose some people to familiar disorders, including premature senility or Alzheimer's disease, to kinds of diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, and to some cancers like those of the breast or colon. Long term, the hope is for better prevention and treatment of the common killers of Western society, even including heart disease. We've done some marvellous things with drugs, uh, even uh, coronary artery surgery, um, heart transplantation. What I would tend to call increasingly high-tech patch-up procedures. Um, and that's, of course, why the health service is so expensive now. Now, one's hope is that by understanding the genes involved in these diseases, one will be able to get much further back to the root cause and treat the disease is much more logically, uh, in other words, treat them before the arteries are gummed up and, the, and people are having heart attacks. We're learning more about our genes because scientists are unravelling the mysteries of DNA, the acid of which genes are made. By listing all the atoms it contains, and that's a Herculean task, doctors will ultimately have a blueprint for man. In 1962, James Watson shared the Nobel Prize with Francis Crick and Maurice Wilkins for his role in revealing the structure of DNA. It was a discovery as historic as splitting the atom. Watson has always believed it has immense power for good, but he's become increasingly concerned it'll be accompanied by perplexing ethical issues. I think it has, uh, will have very, very strong ethical implications. And we should talk about them. Uh, because we, uh, you know, we'll be able to, to look at ourselves and uh, maybe predict whether we're going to come down with a disease. And that's going to, you can ask, so do we want to know it? <laughs> 35 years ago, Watson's work thrilled the university and the laboratory. Now it could affect vital and intimate decisions in the doctor's surgery, ultimately giving doctors powers to predict some illnesses which they can't necessarily cure. In cases, you go to a doctor and say, look at this part of my DNA because it may help me understand the disease I have and might help in a cure. But I wouldn't want it sort of randomly, uh, someone going and looking at my DNA to try and predict, say, whether I'm going to come down with cancer. And in some cases, we're probably going to have that sort of knowledge. I mean, uh, we don't have it today, but it wouldn't surprise me that in some cases uh, we're going to have probes which will uh, be predictive in some cases. And in some cases that knowledge could be very useful because it could say uh, avoid working with really exposure to chemicals which we know are cancer causing or something like that. On the other hand, uh, unless you really can do something about the knowledge, you could just make people rather scared. <laughs> and uh, decrease the quality of their life. So you really, uh, uh, the people who have this knowledge uh, have to be rather wise, I think, and very cautious, I think, in, in uh, advising other people what to do. In the case of a few people, like Paul Lowesby, doctors already have this knowledge. From his family history, Paul knows he has a 50-50 chance of developing an incurable illness called Huntington's career. In four weeks, he'll have the results of a simple test that will show if he's inherited the gene behind the disease. If he has, the symptoms, clumsiness and slurred speech could appear soon. Paul is fully aware of what those symptoms would lead to. 
I would describe it as like watching somebody become a moving vegetable. It is quite frightening. Uh, to know, in terms of the uh, medical definitions of, of it, so obviously you'll get a different viewpoint, but to, me, to watch the slow degeneration such that you cannot stop your body moving, you have difficulty speaking, and you, the whole aspect of your life, such that even drinking a cup of tea becomes uh, a major task, as well as the problems with your mental faculties. Uh, so you're combining, I can't think of a more slow aspect of watching yourself disintegrate. The first dilemma Paul and his doctors had to face was whether he was a suitable person to have the test at all. Paul was interviewed at length to show he could handle the knowledge of a future he can do nothing to prevent. The fear is that knowing about it could ruin whatever time he has left. How easy has it been to have the test? Very, very difficult. And I'm not knocking the medical profession. The whole medical ethic of supposing we make a wrong diagnosis and you would react on the diagnosis we make is a very difficult dilemma for them. And I accept that. I've said, look, I'm at risk 50-50. If you can tell me it's 51-49, that's my decision. I'm trying to remove the decision from you. You know, I am not incompetent, I am not stupid. Well, I'm not, I feel as though I have rationalised this and I've made the decision. But isn't it right that the doctors should be very cautious? Uh, in my opinion, for me, no. However, each person is going to be different and hence the reason for the the interview to see if your uh, your personality is acceptable to to go through with this i mean at the end of the, the day i'm playing russian roulette russian roulette you know i slurred uh and if on uh, november the 20th i'm told i've got it you know do i take the attitude that the gun's gone off in the wrong direction i'm going to take the attitude is okay i've got this disease I may be lucky, I may get 15 years. Let's use it. But as he awaits his results, Paul has to consider yet another dilemma. We're about to As the manager of a rock band, Paul doesn't have to worry about telling his employer if the news is bad. But who would have the right to know? The tests are so new, there are few rules to guide Paul. Who else should have the right to know whether there's a fatal flaw in your genes? Yes, that's a difficult one. I, as I said, it, definitely me, and definitely anybody I want to know about it, and the medical profession that I'm dealing with the, with the problem on. I haven't resolved whether, for example, my GP should know. Uh, any. Why shouldn't he know? Uh, because we don't know the aspect of what's on your file, where's it going to. I do not feel that there's enough control. I'd look at it with insurance. My insurance situation will be uh, diabolical now because I've gone for the test and I cannot lie to an insurance company and say I'm at risk of this disease but I haven't got it. Uh, although I've been for the test. You see, it changes everything. The only person who should decide is the person themselves. I don't think, and you get more complicated ones, if you're a parent, should you test your children? I'd say no. I think it's a child's right to know <laughs> and find out, and not for the parent to sort of say that. And these are the sort of real issues now which I think we should discuss. I would hate to think that, you know, it would be... Uh, I think it will be very frightening the more we find out about it uh, for people to realize that uh, there's a sort of big brother uh, who uh, has knowledge about me, which I don't want them to know. Watson's fear that we could lose our genetic privacy to a big brother state highlights the political issue at the heart of the genetic revolution. Like many scientists, Watson believes we must decide now how far the state has the right to intervene in our genetic affairs. The dilemma is that in Britain, it's the state which provides us with health care. 
So it can also be argued that we'll only receive the full benefits of the genetic revolution if a caring state helps us to understand our genetic frailties. You're locked into the freshest station on 1033 megahertz. And OK London, we have another caller and we should have Jackie on the line. Uh, hi, I'm an uh, expectant mother, right? Yes. I've recently discovered that my boyfriend has sickle cell trait. Right. I'm now concerned um, whether our child may develop the either disease or the trait. Right. Um, well, I think one of the, the things that should have been done... How many weeks are you pregnant, Jackie? Do, how many weeks are you now? Well, I'm just eight weeks. Eight weeks. Well, that's very early. Um, what should be done is that your, your partner should go along and be tested. I would say tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Gene tests can now tell us not just about ourselves, but about the children we may have. And where possible, the health service is already offering us the chance to use that knowledge. Not at the moment, but I think it's quite important that you go along to your doctor and get a letter to be booked into an antenatal clinic. Marvell Brown is a health service worker in London. She's taking time out to help carriers of genetic diseases called sickle cell and thalassemia. Do tell him to pop along there and get tested very, very soon. Fine. After they've been tested, people can be offered cards showing whether they are carriers of sickle cell and thalassemia. If a couple both carry the gene, their children have a one in four chance of being ill. They're both potentially serious blood disorders. It's the state not as big brother, but friendly sister. Instead of asking to know more about our genes, it's encouraging people to know more about themselves, giving them hard genetic facts on which to base personal decisions. People need to find out if they are carriers of, of a particular genetic condition. And conditions like sickle cell disease and thalassemia are, one of the f are two of the few conditions that you can find out whether you are carriers before you have children and therefore allow people to go away and make decisions about what they want to do for pregnancy. But left to the individual, those choices can be hard to make. Karim and Indira Virani have one child, Adil. He has the severe disorder, Thalassemia Major. As he grows older, the treatment will grow more distressing. You'll have to have lengthy injections every night, and there's little hope of a normal life. Last month, when the Viranas were expecting another baby, they asked the NHS to test the genes of their unborn child and agreed to let us film what happened. We both decided that if we didn't go for the test and if we had another one, I don't think we could have coped, and it's not fair on the baby. Bring another one in in the world with all these problems, I don't think it's fair. When will you get the results? Should we should come... get it soon, very soon. <laughs> I'm very anxious. <laughs> I hope it's um, good news. In the lab, samples of DNA from the fetus are tested to see if it's inherited both abnormal genes and will develop thalassemia major. The lab technicians are aware that as more genes are discovered, many other couples may face the dilemma of the Viranas. The fetus has inherited one thalassemia chromosome. If the test is positive, the Viranas will have to decide whether to terminate the pregnancy. To get a final result. I don't think, Indira, there's any point in beating about the bush. You know why we're here. I'm yeah. afraid that it's a bad result and they've actually got a conclusive result. There is no doubt. There's only the smallest error rate that there, that there can be um, in any test. But the picture that was developed this morning is as near as it ever can be a definite result. How sure are they that it's not, un it's not just a minor? The, the error rate they have given me is under half of a percent. So they're With the doctors determined not to influence the decision, the burden of genetic knowledge has fallen squarely on the Virani's shoulders. I mean, you're both carriers. I yes. mean, they're basically looking at, at the fetal tissue and saying whether the baby has a double dose oh. like 
your son or whether it has a single dose and the way they they tell the difference is one reason the viranis can ultimately uh, cope is they've educated themselves to understand the dna technology they're looking at the, the knowledge will help them understand the difficult decision they have to take for normality and there are bands for thalassemia you and your husband will have equal bands of thalassemia and normal because you carry both facilities and your son will only have a thalassemia band, a broad thalassemia band, and this baby has a broad thalassemia band and no normal band. Well, I think you've got to make the decision or confirm your earlier thoughts as to whether you would like to continue the pregnancy or whether you would like to terminate the pregnancy. I think if you'd like to terminate the pregnancy, we've got to get a move on. The decision taken by the Varanis was that they have decided to terminate the pregnancy. Uh, this was something that they had said they were probably going to do um, if they had a bad result. As the expert, as the geneticist, how can you advise without influencing? I think you should really just try and, and take an informative role. Uh, everybody has different personal and moral views on testing on termination and I think that in some ways we should act as technicians when it comes to termination and do what the patient wants. It's the prospect of preventing serious disorders which has led to the introduction of these DNA tests for parents and their unborn children. But as we discover more genes, parents could have the chance to test for less serious conditions. This brings us around to the problem of parental choice, what is quality of life, these very fundamental questions that we've not got to grips with. Uh, should a child with a very mild abnormality uh, be allowed to uh, survive, as it were? Should the parents have the choice of saying, no, I want the very best? Uh, and if there's any chance of even a mild uh, genetic abnormality, I would like that um, pregnancy terminated. So how far should the kind of children we have be influenced by our knowledge of their genes? Many will argue any kind of selection, even by choosing embryos, is immoral. But when new choices arise, some will argue it's only logical to embrace them. It seems to me that choosing as much as you can about what your children will be like, particularly that they will be healthy, free from disease and uh, fit, uh, is not only sensible but morally imperative. As to other more trivial things, perhaps, things like uh, colour of hair, colour of eyes, and so on, um, it seems to me that parental choice is as good as the lottery of nature. And, and in the absence of any cogent arguments as to why parents shouldn't have this choice, I would be in favour of them having it. So far, I've not heard a good argument against them being extended this choice. So you are telling doctors that if parents want to be able to test their children for blue eyes, screen out the ones with the wrong hair colour yeah. that they should be allowed to do it? Yes, I mean there are resource implications for this, but assuming that the resources are there or that they're going to be uh, provided in some way, then yes, I see no reason why not. That view is strongly disputed by the moral philosopher who advised the government on the ethics of test tube baby technology. Baroness Warnock believes that allowing parents to screen for whatever they want would be widely seen as a dangerous abuse. I don't think that parents should have access to tests for whatever they want. I think there should be a list, fixed but not immutably fixed, of conditions that would be generally agreed to be disastrous conditions for a child to have. Conditions which would make the child's life, by any criteria, miserable and the life of the parents equally miserable as they watched it die. I mean, it could be a quite a short list of conditions. And I don't believe that there would be very much difficulty in coming to an agreement about what that list is. You say it would be easy to draw the line and decide what to test for. What about, say, schizophrenia? Would you allow tests for that? I think that if tests for schizophrenia are perfected, then this might be a case where the test would be available for parents who knew that their child was at risk. Premature senility? That, again, I think I, that, that is, is very difficult. But I believe that there should be research 
conducted in order to make such tests possible. Colour blindness? Um, um, well, let, let's wait about all this. Premature senility is obviously very difficult because one doesn't know how premature, premature is going to be. And our parents to decide that they wish their child at all costs to avoid um, suffering from Alzheimer's at the age of 50, when they may well be dead or senile themselves. Um, that is a very difficult question, I think. But I think that there is, at any rate, though there may be difficulties around the ages, there is a clear central call of conditions where parents should be allowed to have the tests. And the fact that there are difficult decisions at the ages doesn't entail that one mustn't concentrate on the middle part. The first real test of this argument, and the threshold over which some say we should not cross, is the case of the common mental illness known as schizophrenia, which affects up to one in a hundred adults. Genes don't just affect our health, but our behaviour, the kind of people we are. Some speculate there may even be genes that make us more musical. There's certainly strong evidence there are genes which can predispose people to mental disorders, working perhaps with environmental triggers like stress. It's a possibility already being considered by some of the quarter of a million people in Britain who've suffered breakdowns diagnosed as schizophrenia, breakdowns that can be as hard to bear as any kind of physical illness. I went through several months in which um, I hallucinated quite wildly and had audio hallucinations and saw visions of hell and of what was going to happen to me after my death. And I was told in quite unequivocal terms exactly what was going to happen to me. And it was all very unpleasant. What was wrong with you? Um, I was suffering, I'm told, from paranoid schizophrenia. Do you accept that diagnosis? I do accept that diagnosis with some reservations. Does it make any difference to you to be told that schizophrenia may be caused by your genes? Um, not really overall. Um, but I think this issue is a very dangerous issue. Um, and I do find it very worrying. I am worried that people will be allowed to abort um, children, babies, fetuses, who have this genetic predisposition. Um, I think that is very dangerous and I think it's very unfair. I haven't got chronic schizophrenia. Um, I can live with what I've been through. Um, it is something that is more or less over. Um, and I would not choose to have been aborted. Um, and a lot of the people I know who have suffered far more than I've suffered um, and are chronic schizophrenics lead lives, the quality of which isn't, um, perhaps what the quality of life for other people is. But nevertheless, there is some quality of life there. Um, I don't think the chronic schizophrenics that I know would choose to be dead or to have been aborted. Speculation about a gene that predisposes people to schizophrenia has centered around the work of Dr. Hugh Gerling. Gerling has been examining DNA from families with a high rate of breakdown. His work has yet to be published, but Gerling confirmed to us he has found an abnormal genetic pattern in families he's studied. He believes it could be conclusive evidence of a genetic cause for schizophrenia. Quite a large proportion of people with schizophrenia have relatives who also have schizophrenia, about 30% of them. So I would expect that at least 30% of schizophrenia is genetic and possibly caused by a single gene. 30%? 30%. And those are cases that you could test for? Yes. In specific families, we could already predict um, who is affected or who is carrying the gene. I think we've also shown that it's possible to inherit this abnormal gene and not develop schizophrenia. 
At the hospital where he works, Dr. Gerling believes that while such tests are not yet available, they could lead to earlier diagnosis and better treatment, while parents could have the chance to avoid passing such genes onto their children. But the evidence that some at risk will not develop schizophrenia underlies the ambiguities that may arise from his work. Some people say that schizophrenia is often simply a label which society attaches to unacceptable behavior. Yes. Individuals that have worked with schizophrenics, who uh, looked after their, them and their families, don't generally feel that. Um, the more experience you have of the um, social disability, the occupational decline, the inability to think clearly, and the experience of hallucinations and delusions, the more experience of all that that you have, the more you realize it is a disease and the medical model applies. Gerling's critics include MIND, a pressure group that represents the interests of some patients and their families. One good organization to try would be... The they British have long been concerned about the labeling of people as schizophrenic. They, um, they fear that genetic tests, however voluntary, could unfairly stigmatize some adults and set a disturbing precedent for antenatal screening. How are you going to see another doctor? If we could pinpoint the specific gene and show that the probabilistic level uh, that it would lead to a very specific disability was high, 90 odd percent, then of course we might be okay. But whilst we're still saying that we think we've found the gene for something which was a very broad and woolly form of distress, then I think we're on very, very dodgy ground. We're on the, a slippery slope to saying we can um, screen out people who just happen to have different views to our own, perhaps political views, perhaps views which just don't accord with the way society operates at the moment. And I think that's a terribly dangerous slope to go down. Are you concerned that you may be opening up something of a Pandora's box? I think a lot of the anxieties seem to be greater before the practical technology is available. Uh, with Huntington's chorea and cystic fibrosis and thalassemia, which have affected different uh, and quite small populations of patients, um, anxieties were present before the technology and subsequently people seem to have adopted a much more relaxed attitude towards it and see the positive side. I think in general there are many positive things um, coming out of recombinant DNA research in medicine and schizophrenia is no exception. I'm warning against going down roads which could lead to even greater problems and I think society through Parliament and through the law has to regulate what is done. Society has a duty to its citizens and to itself to ensure that advances in science and technology don't destroy society. At the heart of this debate over DNA technology is the fact that scientists have little control over how others may interpret their work and the conclusions they may draw. Eugenics was taken up by the Nazis. They began to essentially say that people's traits were determined by the genes. And if you looked and did genetic analysis, you could decide who was good and who was bad. Human beings weren't born to be good or bad. Sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad. So I think we really uh, have to be very careful if we would get such knowledge that it does not fall into the wrong hands. But isn't the best way of doing that to have strict rules and regulations? Yes, uh, I, what I'm Drawn afraid, up by the politicians. Oh, politicians are often are silly people. Uh, and uh, they will often make regulations which sound good and don't do good. And I think we have to worry about doing good rather than seeming good. And uh, that's where uh, I think we have to educate the public, make them DNA literate, know what choices they have. If we all do this well, we're going to end up with a better society <laughs> through this knowledge. If we don't do it, we'll make an even more paranoid society. In Britain, governments have long been profoundly wary of entering the moral quicksand of genetics. And the objectives of an ethics committee are, one, to protect the interests of society in general. They've left research guidelines largely in the hands of ethics committees. 
think we ought to add to that the patients themselves. But there's only one such independent committee with the power to oversee clinical practice on a national level. It's called the Voluntary Licensing Authority, and it was set up after the Warnock Report to license test tube baby clinics. It occurs to me we ought to promote a positive attitude in ethics committees towards asserting the interests of patients. Um, its decisions are based, its members believe, on widely accepted moral principles. These members include a rabbi, a theologian, an actress, and eminent scientists and doctors. But it has no legal powers and no brief to oversee the latest genetic technology. Things change so rapidly in this field that any permanent principles seem to be, uh, to be unworkable. What we need, though, is a body of responsible people prepared constantly to review the latest scientific developments in the light of the best available arguments and try to decide case by case what we should permit in our society. I think we do need to regulate the uses that our new knowledge is going to be put to. I think there's an enormous distinction that we have to draw between regulating knowledge that's to say, saying that there are some things we oughtn't ever to know, and regulating the application of knowledge. And the second, I think, we ought to do. What kind of regulation should there be? I believe there should be um, a licensing body that would examine proposals for research and also examine all kinds of private clinics and all kinds of, as it were, new medical treatments and see whether those were going to be licensed or not be licensed. In the absence of such rules, some people are already choosing their future and taking difficult, often lonely decisions. The Viranis have had to decide whether to have another handicapped child. As genes are discovered for different illnesses, thousands more could face similar dilemmas. Others have already decided they do want to know about their DNA, even if the news is bad. Society may have to decide on rules to protect people faced with such decisions, but it will still be argued they're best taken by those who have to bear the consequences of their own genetic destiny. I don't think these decisions should be made by wise groups of bishops or something like that. I think they should be made by the individual person. I wouldn't trust any other group to tell me what's best for myself. <laughs> now, I may be a fool and make a mistake, but uh, I think uh, in the last analysis, we'll all be better off to educate ourselves so we can make these choices ourselves rather than saying we're too silly or too stupid or too bigoted to make the decisions ourselves. Royal Highness the Prince of Wales shocked the establishment